Welcome again to my accounting tutorial YouTube channel where I translate technical accounting topics to a storytelling version sort of. And in this video, we're going to start a new topic which is the accounting for loans receivable. So here are the subtopics that we're going to talk about. So in this current series, we're going to start immediately with a relatable illustrative problem. And based on that problem, we're going to make solutions and journal entries immediately also. And then, I will try to twist the illustrative problem to emphasize more things. And we are also going to talk about some theories that you need to know based on IAS or International Accounting Standards or IFRS Standards. And lastly, we will end the series with the possible questions that might be asked of you on tests and examinations. Okay, so if you're ready, then let's get started. So let's start with the point of view. So the point of view that you're going to take in accounting for loans receivable is of the creditor. So if this is the beginning of the loan transaction, you are this one. So you are the one who will give money first to the debtor, but afterwards, you will be the one who will collect for interest and principal. And you will be this guy. So I'm so sorry for the picture. Okay, let's move forward. But I think it would be much easier if you assume that you are a bank, which extends loans to earn interest income. So, it's easier that way. So again, your point of view is you are a bank which extends loans to earn interest to customers. Okay? Now, before the releasing of the loans, a loan agreement must be signed by both the creditor and debtor. So, we will not focus on the legalities of the agreement. What we will focus are the details that you need as an accountant of a bank or creditor so that you'll be able to account the loan and its related transactions until the end of the maturity date. Okay? So, what are those details? First, we have the principal. Well, you just have to think that this is your main receivable. And actually, the interest that you are to receive will be based on this. Okay? Next is we have the nominal interest rate. And the interest payment dates. So nominal interest rate is used to get the amount of interest to be received from the debtor. And normally, the rate is just multiplied with the agreed principal payment here to get the interest that you will receive as a creditor. Okay? Whereas the interest payment dates are the schedules for collection of interest. So it can be annually or semi-annually or quarterly or monthly. But if the problem is silent, then interests are considered collected at the end of each year. So, that's the three uh, details that you might extract from this loan agreement. So, the other details will be given later. So, the other detail that you need to extract from the loan agreement is the maturity date which is the date where the principal is normally collected. But sometimes, principal is collected little by little at multiple dates, especially in actual scenarios. Well, if you summarize, actually this is the date where the principal and the interest payments by the debtor stops. So that's the maturity date. And the last detail that I need to emphasize is the origination cost received from the borrower. Now, if you as the creditor are to release a loan, normally you won't be able to release the whole principal because you need to have deductions on the amount because of costs in processing the loan. So those costs are called origination costs received from the borrower. So it is already accepted by the public that when you loan, there are really charges like service charges and etc. But if you want to have some specifics, here are some examples of those costs. So the first one is the legal fees and cost of finalizing the documents and finalizing the contract. And the second one is assessment costs for collateral, if there are any collateral assets. Okay? 
Another is that cost for credit investigation of the borrower and costs of other verification procedures because you wanted to know the profile of your borrower. Okay? Or such origination cost can be charged for a simple reason. It's just a charge because of taking a credit risk or the risk of non-payment of the borrower. So, that's what origination costs are. And normally, the deductions are indicated in the policy of the creditor at a percentage form. Like for example, 2% of the loan principal. So, that means only 98% of the principal is released to the debtor or the borrower. Okay? So, those are the details of the loan agreement that you need to extract to account for the loan transaction from the releasing of the loan until the maturity date. Now, before you can account the loan, you still need two other information which are not normally found in the loan agreement. So, what are those? Let's talk about that after this. So, number one that you need to know is the direct origination cost that you incurred as the lender or creditor. So, it's not normally found on the loan agreement. So, why? Because it's the actual legal fees that you have paid or costs of credit or cost of collateral investigation or investigation of your client or borrower. So, those costs are normally not um, disclosed to the borrower so it's not in the loan agreement and normally this amount is actually lower than this origination fees received from the borrower of course for obvious reasons right so the origination costs that we have talked about earlier are costs that the borrower has paid to you by means of course of your advance deduction from the debtor's proceeds okay so in substance that's a cash inflow and this is normally deducted from your loan's receivable account balance. Of course, for obvious reasons again. Like for example, if you have given a loan of 2 million, but you deducted 5% or 100,000 origination cost, so effectively, you only released 1.9 million to the debtor. Okay? So you should only recognize 1.9 million also. Okay? So... How is it so different from this direct origination cost incurred? Actually, this is your cost. This is your cash outflow. Okay? And the amount for this one is added to your loan's receivable account. Because aside from giving up money to the debtor as a loan release, you also give up money for this so that the loan agreement will be pushed through. Okay? Or the loan agreement will be finalized. Okay? So, in summary, any amount that you have given up, like the proceeds given to the debtor, and the direct origination cost that you as the creditor paid or incurred, must be added or recorded in the loan's receivable account. While, any amount received from the borrower, like this origination cost received from the borrower, and of course, Payment of interest and principal in the future shall be deducted from your loan's receivable account. Easy, right? But let me emphasize that this is just pertaining to direct, direct origination costs. So, if you see indirect origination costs, those will be treated as expense immediately. And you should not add them in the loan's receivable account. You should not add it in the loan's receivable account. Okay? Again, indirect origination costs are expensed immediately, not added in the loan's receivable account. Okay? Now, the second information that you need is the effective interest rate. Why? Because if these two origination costs are present, this received from the borrower as well as this direct origination cost incurred and paid, then the loan's receivable account will become very different from the agreed principal. And if that happens, 
then you cannot use the nominal rate in the measurement of your loans receivable in the subsequent dates. Okay? So, let's continue talking about loans receivable in the next episode to keep this video short. So, if you learned, please click like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be updated on my next videos.